Major funding for this program is provided by grants from HSH Nordbank and First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, Allied Partners, Murray Hill Properties, Bank of America, SJP Properties, Greenberg Traurig. Additional funding for this program is made possible by grants from Arbor Realty Trust, BRT Realty Trust, Burden LLP, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Habitats, City Investment Fund, Cushman and Wakefield, Eastern Consolidated, Essex Capital Partners, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, McSam Hotel Group, Must Development LLC, Newmark Knight Frank, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal Inc., Signature Bank, Sydney Fetner Associates, Studley, Stonehenge Partners, Swig Equities, Extreme Contracting and Deconstruction. Hello, my name is Michael Stola, host of the Stola Report, Real Estate Trends in the Tri-State Region. This summer has been what people might call the summer of discontent for financial uh, institutions. Uh, it's been a credit crisis. There's a credit crunch. There's all these problems. People can't get loans. You know, the, the investment bankers hurt this market, the subprime, all of this. But you know what? That's that's something that I'm not, not knowledgeable about. So what today I did is I, I'm bringing together three CEOs of New York-based uh, financial institutions to tell us what, they, what their feelings are. I'd like to introduce Joe DiPaolo, uh, President and CEO of Signature Bank, Mark DeFazio, President and CEO of Metropolitan National Bank, and last but not least, Lowell Dansker, uh, Chairman and CEO of Intervest National Bank. Are we in a credit crisis? Is, uh, is there turmoil in the markets? So you pick up the newspaper each day, you hear uh, country banks let, let go 12,000. What's, what's going on, Joe? What's happening in the market? Um, Michael, I think it's a situation that uh, for the three of us here is probably more of an opportunity than, uh, than, ca than uh, a crisis. Uh, others may look at it as a crisis. Uh, I think, as you know, uh, we thrive uh, a little bit more than others when there's the chaos. And so for us, being a bank that's only six years old, our balance sheet was structured so that times like this, where uh, others are in pain, uh, we could take advantage of it. So I wouldn't, for myself... Right, but you know, I think, Joe, what, what it really is, it's not, from what I see, I don't see any true commercial banks or even savings banks who are in pain. I think that pain is the investment banks or certain mortgage banking companies who have the pain. I think what's, what's happening is that, as you bring up, this is an opportunity for bankers who understand the market to see what's happening and to lend in this specific market. I mean, Lowell, your bank is in existence how many years now? Since 1993. 1993. Mark? Uh, 1999. Okay. And, and Joe, it's 2001. 2001. Okay. You, you've seen in the banking side, all three of you have seen in the banking side's ups and downs, but how would you look at the market today compared to the crisis of 1994? I mean, you went into the banking time when there was definitely a crisis. The difficulties that exist in, quote, the banking business today uh, seem to be that there are uh, parties uh, that are investment parties that have suffered losses or potentially will suffer losses on subprime. Uh, the banks that are here with you today, we're not in the subprime business. We're commercial lenders. And what has happened is that there has been a tightening of credit because the uh, Wall Street conduits can no longer sell the commercial mortgages to the investment community, and therefore the borrowers now look to the traditional bank, which maybe has not been as competitive in the last five or six years, 
uh, because we under, operate under rules and regulations under the federal government rules that uh, Wall Street lenders do not. And therefore, there are opportunities for us to come and be of service to clients who need to close transactions now in the face of a tightening credit market. But the tightening credit market, and let's look at this, is having a rippling effect on other areas. If, okay, you don't originate any residential mortgages. That's correct. Uh, for individual. You originate and you used to originate and sell them and you used to originate and sell. But when you originate a mortgage at five, it was a 30-year mortgage, you're able to get five and a quarter percent. And now you have to pay seven and a half percent. Somebody, as we were saying prior to the show, and you're buying an apartment or buying a home, you have a certain more, uh, amount of money that you budgeted. You know, it's the mortgage, it's the principal, it's the interest, it's the taxes. And if your mortgage payment's going to go up $200 a month, mm -hmm. there's food, there's others. On people who borrow to the maximum in those situations, they will have to cut back on something. And whether it's cut back on buying the new apartment at X dollars or cut back on buying the new car or cut back on going into the restaurants. So there's, there's a, there is a ripple effect through the economy. We haven't felt it here in New York yet. It's happened in other parts of the country, but not here. You lend in Florida. Have you yes, felt I it in do. Florida? No, because the kinds of loans that we do in Florida are on existing occupied properties. They're not condo development loans, not condo conversion loans, and not land development loans. Okay, you know, let, let, let's bring that out. At New York is still condo mania. People come to Joe DiPaolo, Mark DeFazio, Lowell Dansker to say they, they want a, they have this great location maybe in Long Island City, in Greenpoint, you know, uh, or Williamsburg, their family has owned this property for years, there's zero basis, you know, it was a warehouse and now the carpet company is moving out. What's your thoughts about lending to, in, in, these, in these little crazy critical times, what's your thoughts about lending and how do you determine who you want to lend to? It's usually somebody that, uh, as you know, uh, the way we bring our bankers on board is they usually have three, two to three decades of experience. So the, the clients that we're dealing with or the prospects that we're dealing with, there's some sort of long-term relationship with the banker. And uh, we try not to make a, an overall decision on what we're going to do in a particular area. We just really try to take it one at a time. I think even before the show, we talked about an area like Greenpoint where, although I said it before the show, that that was, seemed to be an area that was holding up strong, I think it's because of not only the area, but because of the type of people that are building in there. So for us, it's really an advantage that we're staying in the New York area because we kind of know the people and not go outside. I take a little different approach. I won't refi land. I won't refi a vacant building. I'll do the acquisition loan with new equity going in with a new plan but I won't refi. You won't give the person the additional money? No. Mark? You know, I still think there's a big desire to live in New York City, and there's a lot of promise here for people to grow professionally and financially. So, you know, we're open-minded, and we're just um, careful. I think we're more careful than we are conservative, and we're a relationship lender, and um, we, we generally know uh, the people we're lending money to and it comes down to a function of the feasibility of the project and regardless of whether you're in the 80s or the 90s everybody was still doing business there was some activity you know um, somebody today who's uh, suffering from a downturn in the marketplace is somebody else's opportunity um, what you have to do is isolate the transaction as best you can know the people you're lending money to analyze the feasibility of the project and uh, you go in there with your eyes open uh, what you're seeing today uh, is a function of, well, perhaps the developer is not going to make the kind of rate of return. Uh, perhaps the buyer is not going to spend as much. Maybe the rate is a little bit higher. Uh, maybe it will force the owner or the buyer to live more within his means because rates are a little bit up. So he won't buy the seventh floor, he'll buy on the second floor. You know, he won't buy the penthouse, he'll have to sacrifice and buy something with less of a view. But absorption in New York City hasn't been a problem um, for a long, long time, and I've been lending in this market for a long time, and some of the best relationships I've secured uh, go 20, 25 years. Um, and it's about lending to relationships. It's about lending to good, feasible projects. Um, you but, can find but, but the greatest my, location. But my question for all three of you, in, in this time, okay, what's a good, feasible project? Is it a rental apartment house? Is it 
you know, there was an article in City Limits the other day talking about Wall Street going to Harlem. And what I meant by Wall Street going to Harlem is that there are major investment funds uh, who are going out there and buying apartments, and uh, they were buying apartments and getting outrageous financing, and these multifamily. And, you know, rental apartments, people have to live. You just all said this. People have to live. Because my, my focus is, is more on multifamily and occupied properties, um, I have to kind of step back and I look at the, the, um, the condo market, per se. Um, as I mentioned before, New York has not really felt the effects of this credit crunch, credit crisis yet. And, uh, will New York feel this? I believe it will, and I believe that there will be layoffs to a certain extent, that there are people who were involved in the business of uh, securitizing loans and reselling them. They have nothing to sell, therefore the bosses in the office are going to say, we've got to cut the staff. When that happens, there's a ripple effect, because those are the people who have been buying the condos. Those are the people who have been spending the money, and they have to cut back. And I think that will create an issue where you will see values start to either tap, top out or some of them will recede. And then the more questionable properties or projects that are on the fringes of whatever the fringe might be will then not be funded. And then it creates other issues in the, in the marketplace. I agree with Lowell. I, I think that New York has not felt it. Uh, as you know, our, as a percentage of our loans, real estate is not a large percentage. And so people constantly ask me when we're going around the country speaking to analysts and investors, uh, what is the credit quality of your portfolio? And we keep on saying, whether it's in Chicago or Boston or wherever, that New York has not felt the effect. Whether it's real estate or it's somebody that's not in the real estate area, we're seeing many of our clients having robust years. And uh, we say to everyone, uh, I'm sorry, we're just not able to give you our opinion on how bad things are because we're not feeling it right now. It, as Lowell said, it may, it may change. I, I but think right you now know, we I, feel I'm not, good. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to be the, 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 the predator and say that there's doom and gloom. But I, I think what I'm saying and what Lowell's saying is that the market is going to get harder for certain things, and there's definitely a rippling effect. Last week, a, two, a couple of weeks ago, I, I did a show with investment bankers, and basically I said to one of them. I said, I remember when you were a bookmaker because you would slice and dice and sell the loans, and you can't do it today. Uh, Centerline, a major public company, was running a, a seminar, and they sent out a note yesterday that they are postponing the seminar because they cannot be in business with certain of their products. This is a major public company who had mezzanine loans, conduit loans, because they don't have it. Joe? I, you had Scott Shea, who was on my show, the first show of the new season. Mm -hmm. he, you, can, you used to use American Home Mortgage, who really had nothing wrong, and one day they close up shop. In seven days, they went from being this great company to going bankrupt. And there are thousands of people out of work from the one company. Right. From this one company, basically in Long Island, and countrywide laying off 12,000 people, and and they can't get this. So the rippling effect is there. Now, the, the question is, you know, somebody's going to come to you. Lowell has the highest, Lowell only lends for real estate. It's That's his business. business. We do. They're a $2 billion bank only in real estate. You're a five and a half, six $6 billion bank, and maybe 20% is 15% is real estate, right. if, if that much. You're a half a billion dollar bank, and how much is in real estate? About 70%. 70%. So the two of you are highly concentrated. You're in a different manner. How do you, you, know, how do you look at it today, and how, you know, one man's misfortune is another man's opportunity, perhaps, as we said, because a lot of the guys who you are, who are balance sheet lenders, who would hold these loans on the books, do you, you now, you can you can charge a higher spread. It's not there's not necessarily a higher spread. There's still money available uh, through the banking system uh, for real estate operators. What what you have is uh, right now and maybe for the next 90 days, you have the pullback by the conduits, which is creating an issue where borrowers are coming in and saying, "I've got to close," and then the question is whether or not we can ramp up and do what we have to do, which in our case we do do. But that we don't use that as an opportunity to lever the deal in order to take a. Pound so, of flesh so, out so of you're body. not taking the raping, you're not no, taking no. the pound of but flesh. But what we are doing is we are getting paid or compensated properly 
for the job that we're doing. Which I think There's is a difference. Which is a difference because prior to this, when you had the investment bankers making these loans at pricing which didn't make sense, you couldn't get what your risk reward was. Uh, we have the opportunity now to bring You have the opportunity. Yeah. But what are the opportunities? Where do you, you know, you're a banker and you know, people come to you and people watch this on the show and I will tell you, you'll get phone calls and they'll say, oh, Joe DiPaolo, you know, or Mark DeFazio, or Mark Lowell Dansker. These are the situation. You know, who, who uh, Joe, I heard you want relationships, but you know, what's comfort? Do you, do you, do you, do you, you know, we, we were talking too much about Manhattan. You know, there's a place, there's Long Island, there's Westchester, there's Jersey City. You know, what's, what's your thoughts about these other markets? It's the New York metropolitan area, and I look at it all, all as, as, as one market. There, there's another way to stratify it, and that's by the type of real estate. It's not just the physical geographic area, it's all the types of real estate. I there. agree. Uh, Freestanding, single tenant buildings, there's uh, office buildings, there's flex office warehouse space that's in demand, um, there may be um, uh, other mixed use properties. So there's, there's different segments. Real estate is a big word. I, I'm, I'm totally in agreement because there's, you know, uh, I've done a show uh, the prior week and we were talking about rents in Hudson Square in Tribeca and, and the rents have gone up. You know, office buildings over there, you were able to get $20 a foot, now you're able to get $55 a foot. Um, you know, the flavor of the month is, is hotels. Uh, my question is, and I still am very keen on the hotel market, but, you know, I think it's the question of the good operator. I question, you know, everybody wants to be a hotel operator. It's like the old days, everybody wanted to own a restaurant, right? You know, um, I think th there are different markets. And, uh, but uh, relating to that point, Lowell, where do you see, where, what's your sweet spot? Do you like the apartments? And I'd like, I want all three of you to answer. Is it the apartments? Is it the industrial? Is it the office? I mean, wh what's the market that you feel most comfortable to lend? And what's your opinion? That's well, for us, it's the, it's the multifamily. It's the mixed-use properties. Um, it is offices, um, not small offices, but a little bit larger buildings. And it's in the New York metropolitan area and all up and down the East Coast. We're comfortable with the type of product. We go out, we find out what the area rents are. We're looking for the opportunity to make a loan on the kind of property that we would buy as an investor. We buy the one that has the rents that are below market and has an upside potential. Those are the ones that we concentrate on. The ones that are where the rents are at market, that's not my market. And the sweet spot's between three million and about $12 million. Mark? I like diversification. You know, I don't like to say that uh, we're a niche in any one particular area. Uh, cash flow for me is the common denominator. Um, I like to have diversification because it defends me against various different effects of the different types of real estate that's out there. Um, something that's affecting the hotel industry may not affect retail. Something that's affecting office may not affect multifamily or even uh, mixed-use properties or industrial or light manufacturing. So you ha just have to have a lot of knowledge and depth in the, in the product type that you're lending to. And I think that balance really helps you defend yourself uh, against um, real efforts, especially when other banks, your competition is all chasing the same product. Because then what happens is if you're in that space, you're not getting paid for the risk. Because when there's that much competition, the rates are very low. So this allows me the opportunity to get an overall better blend in interest rates or, or spread if I'm diversified. Yeah, yeah I, w I would say diversification as well, but something you touched upon earlier, on the multifamily, uh, at the end of 2006 and the early part of 2007, we started to do some more multifamily. Then the conduits made the pricing such that we actually stepped away and said to some of our very good clients, we really could not do these loans anymore for the different projects that they had. And it was something that Lowell said. We had a couple of clients that were great on taking these 45, 50 uh, number of apartments, townhouse types in the suburbs and really improving upon the cash flow and the conduits were making the pricing so unrealistic for us that we were not getting paid for the risk even even with deposits. So we started to step away a little bit. Now uh, the conduits are not making those loans and uh, we're not going back in and saying aha and trying to take advantage. All we want to do is get paid for the risk. You know, you're talking about maybe 50 basis points more than what the conduit is charging, uh, or now that the conduit's not there, 
uh, they'll pay our price. We're not asking for 100 or 125 or 150 basis points because there are other commercial banks out there that will, will do the deal, and we'll, we'll keep this on our books. So I look at it as an opportunity to maybe do a little bit more multifamily than we were in the earlier part of 2007 because the conduits are not available anymore. You know, you live in Westchester, mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of activity in White Plains and New Rochelle. Lots of, I mean, out of nowhere, there's all this new product. What's your thoughts about uh, all of these condos, these new developments in that market? Well, I, I can tell you, I ask, I live in the north end of New Rochelle, and it's the south end, uh, the downtown area where they're building, uh, well, they have now three major buildings, two rentals and one condo uh, with Capelli and, and Trump, and two or three other buildings to plan to go up. Uh, and what I've been told by people in the area is that as the population is aging and they no longer want to have the homes, they believe they're the ones that are going to be moving into uh, these apartments, uh, uh, whether it's a rental or, or a condominium. They believe they're the ones that have the assets and the wherewithal to buy or rent these apartments. Uh, I just want to know who's going to buy their homes. But if you look, if you walk on Main Street in New Rochelle, mm -hmm. you will see young people, okay, people in their 20s and 30s who have moved into these rentals. They get on the train and within 27 minutes, 29 minutes, they're in Grand Central. The location is phenomenal. So you have them, and they're also going out and they will buy those other homes, but the pricing of those homes will change. Yeah, I have seen that. I, I will say this on the, uh, you know, on the pricing of the homes. On Sunday, I happened to notice, as you know, on the weekends, they have all these open, ho open houses. And I just couldn't believe the number of open houses there were th this past weekend. But one thing I noticed, one house not too far from me, the price has actually dropped $70,000 in the last several weeks. That doesn't mean it was priced correctly right. to start with. It may have been overpriced. It may, may have been overpriced, but I actually, this particular house, I actually thought it was priced Reasonably correctly. Well. And uh, it needs about two hundred thousand dollars worth of work, but I thought it was priced correctly, and they and 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 it has come down. Uh, I, I agree with you about uh, the young people uh, in New Rochelle, but there's going to be another three buildings being put up, and uh, I don't know how they're going to fill them, other than you know some of the older population maybe taking some of those apartments. I think a lot is going to depend on the unemployment rate right. and where it right. goes. You know, one, one of the, the the largest increase in condo prices over the last three years has been in Harlem. Um, they were, they've, they've tripled, the, over 300 percent increase in, in Harlem. What's your opinion of what's happening in Harlem? And as I always say, there are three different Harlems, let's remember. There's East, there's West, and there's Central Harlem. So they're in a different market. Mark? I've always been extremely conservative, uh, north of 100th Street, uh, from uh, water to water. Um, I've always stuck to either high traffic retail or the six-story walk-up. Um, I've never been optimistic about um, the, the, the conversions of higher-end residential um, with the concept of uh, uh, young professionals, you know, traveling south uh, to be in Manhattan. I, I never believed in that. Um, so so you, 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 you wouldn't lend in Inwood? No, no I, I have, but I, again, I stick to retail uh, and I stick to uh, the six-story residential, uh, stabilized, uh, multifamily. Well, I wouldn't I, do the office buildings. I wouldn't do the Inwood, office buildings. Inwood, Washington Heights, I've been lending there. East Harlem, Central Harlem, I've been lending there for years and I continue to do so. Okay, Joe, you grew up in the Bronx. I grew up in the Bronx, but both of my parents grew up in Harlem. And uh, I remember being uh, 10 years old and uh, being on First Avenue uh, near Jefferson Park over there at 114th Street. So uh, I, li I like Harlem. Uh, I, I won't make a blanket statement other than to say, and I think you're aware, we've done probably a, a less than a handful of projects, but uh, each of the projects we looked at individually. and. Uh, I would say that we're generally happy with uh, what, we've, what we've done there. Uh, we haven't done as much as, as Lowell has said, but uh, and I don't let my personal opinion of uh, uh, spending my younger years there where, where my grandparents lived growing up, yeah. but uh, I, I would say we're uh, somewhat bullish on I, I'm a Brooklyn boy, and, and downtown Brooklyn and, and other parts of Brooklyn are really booming. 
uh, Park Slope, the Gowanus. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you got in, in there's a Whole Foods, there's an IKEA, there's a Fairway. You know, there's a lot of things happening over there. What's your thoughts of that marketplace? Those are those are the big things that are happening. But if you we walk down um, Fifth Avenue, Fourth Avenue, and Park Slope, you know, the the Park Slope used to be confined to Seventh Avenue and Eighth Avenue. Park Slope is expanded Fourth Avenue, borders, Third Avenue, even, right? and 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 they're vibrant, alive neighborhoods filled with boutiques and shops and restaurants. Uh, the change has been dramatic. You see a big reinvestment in the brownstones in that area. You can tell it's easier. Somewhat it makes it easier for us lenders when you walk into an area and you see the activity of the retailers and the restaurant owners and people taking a real interest in their homes and reinvesting them in their homes. And you're looking down a side street and it's a brownstone and it's, and it's a manicured lawn. Here you are in Brooklyn. You know you're in a safe zone uh, to a great extent. The project, obviously, the project has to stand on its own, but you feel that this is a place where people want to live. But that same growth's been going on through all the five boroughs. Yeah. Right. Now, the, Mark, you're, you're the, you're the you're, I think you're, you're a native born and you live in Staten Island, okay? Right. What's happening in Staten Island? You know, certain people have never lent and even lent money in that. It's like a foreign land. It's a uh, very strong uh, market, a uh, very strong housing market, a strong retail market. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of office space. So I would imagine that mixed use, mixed use residential and retail is the strength. Um, it's proximity to New York City, to New Jersey, um, to Brooklyn, um, uh, specifically Manhattan, um, uh, is makes it a, a, is a nice place. It's living in the suburbs while you're still in New York City, and the taxes are very low. Now, you know that's one of the suburb. That is the suburb that we're not in, Signature Bank. And uh, for your guests watching the show, if there's a great banker out there who can bring <laughs> business, you'll, you'll <laughs> open up a branch. We 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 would love to open up an office in uh, Staten Island. I agree with. Uh, with Mark, it's a place that uh, I think uh, banks would want to be. Absolutely. Now, I grew up near Coney Island, and you know, there's all this talk about Coney Island. Uh, any thoughts about uh, what's going on in Coney Island, or nearby? I mean, forget Sid's big project. I mean, you know, you're asking a Bronx guy about Brooklyn. Okay, tough question uh, for a Bronx yeah. guy. It, it's it's. I think it's too soon to tell. Um, mm -hmm. There are areas around New York City that need absorption. And I think Coney Island is still out there, I think, in my mind, even in, in the fringe, as to whether or not it will really revitalize itself. And, and who is the identified party? I always want to know who is the target audience for uh, a, a development or a revitalization? Well, who is the developer? Targeted? I think that um, if we're fortunate enough that times stay good, that area will also change dramatically over time, in a short time, too. Right. Um, I mean, if you think about it, how many areas in the city 10 years ago we're in bad shape 15 years ago, mm -hmm. and it just seems like all you're talking about is revitalization. So why would it not continue in an area like that? Hard to believe, 30 minutes are up, and I'd like to thank, uh, Mark, you check your watch, I'm telling you, it's 30 <laughs> minutes. Okay, I, I'd like to thank my uh, three uh, uh, bankers and CEOs uh, for giving insight to their thoughts of the real estate market and the credit crunch. Joe DiPaolo, Signature you, Bank, Michael. Mark DeFazio, Metropolitan National Bank, Thank and you. Lowell Dansker of uh, Intervest National Bank. Thank um, you. See you next week. Thank you. Major funding for this program is provided by grants from HSH Nordbank and First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, Allied Partners, Murray Hill Properties, Bank of America, SJP Properties, Greenberg Traurig. Additional funding for this program is made possible by grants from Arbor Realty Trust, BRT Realty Trust, Burden LLP, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Habitats, City Investment Fund, Cushman and Wakefield, Eastern Consolidated, Essex Capital Partners, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, McSam Hotel Group, Must Development LLC, Newmark Knight Frank, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal Inc., Signature Bank, Sidney Fetner Associates, 
Studley, Stonehenge Partners, Swig Equities, Extreme Contracting and Deconstruction.